How's it going, and welcome to my continued guide of Chapter 5 of the 5th Edition module, Tomb of Annihilation. This video is going to cover Level 4 of the tomb, but before I go into names or spoilers or any fun stuff, I'm going to say, players, get the frick out of here, send your DMs this way, DMs that are already here, let's go ahead and dive right in, because this is nearing the climax. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to level 4, the Chambers of Horror, a homage essentially to the Tomb of Horrors. This is the last floor that is connected by the Grand Staircase. Uh, you will note though that there is two more levels beyond this, and the only way accessible is through a hole in the ground. Very accessible, it's right there, but that is going to lead us into uh, area 45. But before I get there, let's go ahead and dive right into a Sarax warning for level 4 here. We have Death to Fire, Dine or Drown, Precious Air, and Falling Sand. Uh, that'll be a little hint at how to get to Shigambi's tomb. We also have The Army Sleeps in Silence, The Mirror Holds 12, Find the Iron Scepter's Twin, and The Maze Holds the Key. All of which, very relevant, and once again, if they actually pay attention to this stuff and apply it to what they experience, they can actually make it out of harm's way. However, if they don't apply Acerax warnings and tutelage, they are going to be in for a terrible time. The first stop on level 4 is going to be Area 54, the Gargoyle Guardians. There are four four-armed gargoyles. You know, a lot, of, a lot of fours going on around here. Uh, that's probably the joke, right? A lot of fours. These four armed gargoyles are really, really bad news. If they decide to attack the party in mass, uh, higher level parties are probably going to get walled because they have a lot of health, they have resistance to some damage, and uh, they'll be pumping out a lot of attacks. Fortunate for your party, though, these guys actually are not natively hostile. In fact, to ease their, you know, their their anger. All your players have to do is give a small tithe. Every single one of the gargoyles is sitting on top of a pedestal, and each of the pedestals has a indication on how much gold it wants. Uh, there is one copper, one silver, one gold, and one platinum. More than likely, your players aren't going to have some type of increment of cash. You know, maybe they forego using coppers and silvers and just use gold. Maybe they don't find any platinum pieces. But you don't need to worry about that. The only thing they need to do is drop enough money in there to get their value. If they do this for all four of the statues, then no problem. Uh, easy peasy, the gargoyles don't do anything. However, if they try to leave this room without paying the gargoyles toll, they are going to get hunted down by these gargoyles. It doesn't say exactly, you know, what prompts them immediately to do this. It just says that they, they go after it. Or unless, of course, they get attacked or the base that they're standing on top of gets attacked. Uh, I would recommend that if your players try to walk past these gargoyles, you have the gargoyles kind of say, uh-uh-uh, and kind of wave their fingers and point to, you know, you know hey, pay the fine without having to say it. Uh, because it would be kind of unfun to just, you know, walk past this area and just get ganked for no reason. Uh, so definitely let them in on, hey, maybe you should pay attention to what they're sitting on. That being said, if your players feel like they're up to the task, they can totally fight these gargoyles. And with good tactics and uh, good rolls, they can totally deal with it. If they destroy the gargoyles, they can loot the pedestals. And all of the pedestals are going to have a pretty sizable amount of cash uh, split between all four of them. So if they love uh, dealing with a whole bunch of loot, uh, then they can certainly uh, earn their money back. Area 46, the Lizard Den. Here we have a hallway, and at the end of the hallway is another Green Devil statue. But where all the other Green Devil statues have something scary about them, this one doesn't. In fact... Residing inside of it is an awakened lizard. What is an awakened lizard doing here? Good question. This lizard was given sentience by some druid just somewhere out in Schult. And the lizard, after some time, found its way to Omu. Uh, after some time in Omu, the company of the Yellow Banner found this lizard and basically took him as sort of a pet. 
But dickishly, it actually states in the text here that the Company of the Yellow Banner captured it and brought it to the tomb, thinking it might be useful for setting off traps. So, really a dick move on their part, you know, using the lizard to uh, try to set off some traps. Joke's on them, though. The lizard is alive, and most of the Company of the Yellow Banner is dead. The lizard obviously isn't going to be of too much help as it, you know, is just a tiny little lizard, 2 HP and, you know, no attack or anything. But can make for a pretty cool companion to have, you know, an awakened lizard. Who doesn't want a uh, smart little, you know, pet that can, you know, hang out with them on their shoulder? The lizard den hallway hides a nefarious trap and leads to a tomb. And that takes us to Area 47, the Elemental Cells. If your player is... Uh, basically touch the walls and find the right spot they can find what it begins in the fire cell and that takes us to area 47a they can feel that heat is emanating off of this place there is it just it's super duper hot uh but the real really scary thing about this trap is if your players walk in and withers is still alive withers is going to close the door behind them and they're going to be trapped in this in this room what's so dangerous about this room is that if they get close enough to the other end of the cell, they're going to start seeing the lava basically pour out. Uh, every single round, they're going to have to make a DC 20 dexterity saving throw or take 4d10 fire damage. That's going to add up real quick. How do they, you know, get past this? Well, they have to extinguish the candle which is lit inside. And what, that's what is really cool about this trap is that there's multiple ways you can handle this. It even states here there's two specific ways. If the candle's flame is doused with water or some other liquid, creatures in the cell are transported to the water cell. If the candle's flame is blown out or smothered out, they are taken to area 47C, which is the air cell. So really, really cool way to incorporate traps with multiple ways to answer them and multiple results on how you answer them. This, however, is when it's going to get into some really finicky territory. If your group gets separated, meaning that, you know, one person's in the cell and then they try to recreate this or do something else, you're going to have instances where people are moving from cell to cell here, and every single one of these cells is on a turn timer. So you are going to have to, one, call for initiative here, but two... Uh, it's really up to you how you handle the individual nature of these traps. Are you going to pull that one player aside and talk to them? Or are you going to trust that your players aren't going to metagame and just say it all out loud? Uh, because if you do say these things out loud and some of these traps get set off, there is a very good chance that they could die in them. The water cell can drown you, the air cell you can run out of oxygen, and the earth cell you can uh, get crumble to a pulp and we'll get to that in a moment so i would personally recommend that if you're running a game of you know hardcore elemental survival nature then you keep it as is and that you pull players to the side one by one when it's their turn this might be timely but i it's really hard to say that people aren't going to metagame if you know someone dies at the table and then they wind up in the same area you know Take of that what you will. So one or more of your players have decided to douse the candle in the cell with water. What's that going to lead to? That is going to lead to area 47B, the water cell. When they get to the water cell, they're going to look around and see that this place is kind of gross and dingy. Uh, they're also going to see that there is a merfolk skeleton in the wall. And the walls are actually coated with oysters and snails. Uh, that's probably not going to immediately register with them with anything. But the important part here is that if they are in the cell, every single round, the water is going to raise by one foot. And there is no way to prevent this. And also important to note is that in all these cells, there's anti-magic fields, meaning that no, no shenanigans, no resistances, no none of that. So your players have no magic, they find themselves in a room with water rising, and it's going to hit the ceiling in 10 rounds. What do they do? 
a really strange answer to solving this riddle, but they're going to have to take either one of the oysters or one of the snails off the wall and eat it. What's really nice here is the first time an oyster or a snail is taken off the walls, the anti-magic field stops in this room, which could help some players, depending on what type of items they might have. But that's not going to solve the issue of the water rising. They need to eat one of the oysters or one of the snails in order to get transported to the next room. And here is once again where their different decisions will lead to different rooms. Eating an oyster is going to lead you to area 47C, the air room. And eating a snail is going to take you to area 47D, the earth cell. The water in this room does not stop until everybody is out of this room. And it basically drains by one foot per round. Meaning that if people are following in their footsteps, it's not like the water just magically resets or whatever. If someone is trying to follow in someone's footsteps, uh, they will find themselves in a difficult spot as well where the water is rising. So, so far we've had to dodge lava and we've had to avoid drowning. What could be worse than that? Well, actually, a lot of people's fears of running out of oxygen. And that's going to take us into area 47C, the air cell. Your players are going to note two things immediately when they get in here. One, the place is entirely pitch black, meaning anybody who doesn't have dark vision is going to be in for a terrible time. But two, most important of all, is the fact that there is no air. People will immediately begin suffocating because there is no oxygen in this room. It's an oxygen-deprived area, and basically what that means is you have a number of rounds equal to your constitution modifier, to find the answer and escape. This room also has an anti-magic field, meaning that any sort of uh, magic that could possibly make you survive is going to be depleted here. Really, really bad news. So how do players get out of this terrible mess? Well, along the walls is an Aarakocra's uh, skeleton embossed in the walls. And if they take one of the bones of this Aarakocra and snap it and basically suck out the marrow, uh, they'll actually be able to get some oxygen, and this will, in fact, uh, deplete the uh, anti-magic field and get them to the next area. The next area this time, however, if uh, is fortunately not the next cell, but it actually takes them to Area 48, which is Shigambi's tomb. But we will be getting to that in a moment. Uh, so, more often than not, uh, we're going to have some players that find their way in here who don't have dark vision, and because this is a no-oxygen environment, there is no torches, and because it's an anti-magic field, there is no light. So what do players do if they're blind? Uh, basically, they're going to have to make a perception check. It states here that they have a DC-13 perception check, and if the check succeeds, they will find one of three things. They can find either... The wall carvings, the air coker skeleton, or the candle. It doesn't state how you decide which key feature they discover, so I'd, I would simply have them roll a 1d3. And on a 1, they find the wall carvings, on a 2, they find the air coker skeleton, and on a 3, they find the candle. This room is a nightmare for a lot of people. Only being able to survive for a number of rounds equal to your constitution modifier means that there is a decent amount of people who will only survive one to two rounds here. In fact, the majority of characters ever created are going to have a constitution between 8 to 14. So uh, if they're not uh, creative or lucky enough, they are going to die here. So what about the poor players who find themselves in Area 47D, the Earth Cell? If they take a look around and actually make a pretty easy perception check, they'll be able to see that there is a crevice in the center of the floor suggesting that there is a uh, pit trap. What this is actually is a nightmare. After anybody has gone in here, sand begins to fall from the ceiling at a rate of w 6 inches per round. This turns the area into difficult terrain after one round, which shouldn't be that much of an issue. They're probably not moving around too much, so the difficult terrain's practically irrelevant. The real issue is that this falling sand, once 12 inches have basically landed uh, on the floor here, it is going to cause the pit trap to fall below, and that is where the absolute horror comes from. Once 12 inches of sand have hit the ground, the pit is going to open up, and this is going to give everybody in the room a DC-15 dexterity check, and if you are absolutely hugging the walls, you have advantage on this check. But, if not, then 
on a failure, you're going to get chewed up between two rolling pins. And this is going to do 24 D10 force damage. Force damage being something almost no one can resist. There's only one item in the game that lets you do that. And no class can natively resist force. And more importantly, uh, the amount of damage is so severe, no one would be able to survive this unless they were extremely high level or had an extremely high constitution. Very unlikely. And if this damage reduces you to zero, you are ground over pulp and totally dead. Cue that one guy from Indiana Jones who gets uh, basically turned into a paste. Once again, this is another area with an anti-magic field, meaning no special toys are going to allow them to do any sort of business here. This is just good old-fashioned legwork. So how do they get out of this nightmare? Well, that is the unfortunate part here. The only way they're finding themselves out of this room is by pressing a button, which uh, with an easy perception check, they can see this button. The issue is this button is uh, basically recessed into the wall, and it does not allow itself to be pressed until the floor has already caved in. This can be overturned by making a uh, Thieves Tools check, uh, DC is 17. But the issue here, of course, is they if they don't have Thieves Tools, they're going to have to actually wait until the pit trap opens up, and at which point they have a basically DC 15 save or die. Really, really scary stuff. But should they survive uh, the horrible fall, then they can press the button and the door will open up and they can find themselves into Area 48 Shagambi's. This trap is a nightmare, both for players and DMs. Uh, for players because, of course, they can easily get killed. And for DMs because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things going on. And if you want to keep it more secretive, then you're going to have to be pulling people off to the side one by one. Uh, so a lot of moving parts here. Uh, you definitely need to have your eyes glued to every single one of the pages and reread and reread and reread again how these traps work and how they can be overcome. Because uh, some of them require very, very specific workings. And you have to remember that the anti-magic fields are up. Because if they just come in here and cast some spells, la dee da then uh, you got to say, oh, hey, you know, that, that doesn't work. So a lot of things going on here. An excellent trap, and uh, hopefully your players uh, can uh, overcome the terrible atrocities that may occur. Whether your players get teleported here, or they find themselves going through a door that they created, they can eventually find themselves in Area 48, Shigambi's Tomb. The thing that they'll note about Shigambi's Tomb looking inside is that this place is has a terracotta army uh, basically built up all around the, the the sarcophagus if the players walked into here easy peasy no problem however if they teleport into here they're going to end up on one of three teleportation circles as they look around this room they are going to see that in addition to all the warriors that are lined up there's a whole bunch of pottery shards that are essentially like destroyed uh, they all lead to the sarcophagus this is actually a really cool area here. If they make any loud noise at all, then all the terracotta warriors are going to all snap their heads in unison and partially draw their blades. This is their first and only warning that you should not create loud noise. So the players should hopefully catch the hint and uh, try to progress uh, stealthfully here. The stealth thing isn't that bad, only requiring a DC 12 stealth check for people that are walking around here. This is made at disadvantage if they walk over the party shards, which is, unfortunately, the only way they can go unless they want to, you know, start bumping into the warriors. Uh, but a relatively good rogue or that fighter that for some reason has stealth can easily handle this absolutely no issue. The real issue is when they get to the coffin. When the coffin is opened, a music box essentially ri rings out and will be a loud noise. Uh, if this is their first warning, then they'll have a couple of seconds before they can stop the music box. But if, the, but if it's already past their first warning, then unfortunately for them, all the warriors are going to activate. Uh, a person could theoretically stop this music box from playing by doing a little bit of a perception and snapping the wire. Uh, preventing this music box from triggering. So after braving these four elemental cells and potentially facing this terracotta army, what do they get? 
Uh, they get some pretty cool loot. A uh, bit of gold worth in uh, in some gems and all that. Big deal, whatever. But they get an instrument of the bards. And the instrument of the bards is a pretty dope item. Unfortunately, as the name suggests, it can only be attuned by bards. So if you don't have a bard in the party, uh, this is worthless. I recommend that if you don't have a bard in the party, that you either, one, change the item found, or two, add some leniency into what sort of spellcasters can attune themselves to the uh, instrument of the bards. More so, that this item is what Shigambi is attached to. And my oh my, is Shigambi an awesome trickster god to get yourself attuned to. Shigambi's power is... You can make one extra attack when making the attack action on your turn. Really strong. If you are that fighter that's, you know, attacking twice, going up to three times, amazing. That paladin definitely wants to attack three times. Heck, that rogue might want to attack two times because in case they miss the first time, they can still try and get their sneak attack in. Insanely powerful. And especially if your campaign does get to the 11th level where everyone starts getting... You know, they're, they're either third attack or more damage on their attacks. Getting that extra attack is insanely good. What is the flaw for obtaining this massive power? It's only I never show mercy to evildoers. Which, uh, depending on some characters, you know, that might be an issue. But I'd imagine for the most part, most you know, PCs going through this are going to be A-OK -okay with not showing mercy if it means attacking another time. Really, really powerful stuff here. So something you'll probably note is the fact that the only way to get to Shigambi's tomb is through teleportation. So how do they get back out? Do they have to go through the cells again? Thankfully not. There's three teleportation runes in this room which they can use. The top one and the east one it can be used perfectly fine, and nothing bad happens. However, if they use the south one, they are in for a rude awakening. Because unfortunately, if they use the south one, it seems to be malfunctioning somewhat, and they automatically get polymorphed into one of four animals, such as baboon, bat, flying snake, and quipper. Where does this teleportation take you? It actually takes you to Area 50, which resides right in front of a Mirror of Life Tapping. We will be getting to that in a moment. All in all, an awesome tomb, awesome traps all around, potentially leading to an epic fight or some really cool Mission Impossible stealth uh, play here. Really awesome stuff here, and Shigambi is definitely one of the top gods for giving you an extra attack. Your players, once they get a hold of that, are definitely going to be happy. Moving on forward, we have Area 49, the Maze of Death. Something to note here is, it doesn't matter which of the two ways you come from, the uh, 49A here tells you what you see. There's a stone slab at the end of each of these tunnels, and on of them is an image of a person holding up their left hand and uh, raised with palm extended. Uh, basically, sort of like a, you know, think of... Think of Lord of the Rings, uh, the giant statues. All the players need to do to simply open up this door is do the same. Just hold up their left hand, palm facing forward. Uh, this will cause the both of the stone slabs at the same time to rise and allow them to go into the maze of death. Unfortunately for them, they don't know it's a maze of death yet. Once inside, they'll see that the walls are showing off this awesome motif of a lot of people, like crowds of humanoids, fleeing from a black star in the sky. Um, some really cool imagery to be had here. Uh, really creepy setting. Once they look around, they'll be able to see that in the center of this so-called maze is the Black Opal Crown, one of the legendary items that uh, your players could try and find. This is a trap, however, and if they take the Black Opal Crown, the stone slabs are going to rise back up, cutting them off, and two Bodax are going to emerge from the green devil face in Area 49B. Before we get to all that, uh, let's take a look at Area 49B, the green devil face. This is the truest homage to the Tomb of Horrors, as this green devil face doesn't have a shadow fiend in it. It doesn't have just permanent darkness and silence cast on it. It doesn't lead anywhere. This devil face has a sphere of annihilation in it. Meaning that anybody that dies right into it is going to die. People that, you know, poke something in there is going to lose whatever they 
shoved in there. This is really bad news. And it's even more bad news when Bodax start crawling out of it. So your players take this black opal crown. Then all of a sudden the stone slabs rise up. They are now trapped. And two Bodax come crawling out of this green Dell face. It specifically does say that they are immune to whatever effect of the Sphere of Annihilation. The Bodax are incredibly bad news. They have effects that mean that if you look at them, you could potentially die. They constantly do damage in an aura. It's really, really bad news. And if they work as a pair, uh, they're going to start putting out a lot of damage. Really scary stuff. But at the end of the day, any creature that's got hit points can be killed. So your players deal with these two Bodax uh, and hopefully are all still alive. What do they do then? They look around and they spot the green devil face. They walk around some more and spot that uh, on the back of the stone slabs now that they see is that same person, except this time they're holding up a, a basically a stump of an arm. What this is telling them is if they want to walk away with the Black Opal Crown, someone is going to have to lose a hand here. This can be really, really graphic. You know, this could be someone trying to cut off someone's arm here. Or it could be as simple as someone just simply sticks their hand into the Sphere of Annihilation and then bada bing, you got a uh, stump of a hand. Why would people want to go for this? Well, it states that this thing can be easily worth 5,000 gold but moreover, it can fetch up to four times that value sold at auction in a, in a major city. So if you have an NPC that is from Omu or, you know, someone that's an appraiser of items or just, you know, anybody that knows, you know, some good old jewelry here. The incentive of saying, hey, we can walk away with this item that's 20,000 gold. That might be a tempting offer for someone to, uh, to lose a limb. Pretty gnarly stuff. But should your group decide that, hey, limbs aren't worth losing, all they need to do is simply put the black opal crown back on the pedestal and the stone slab goes right back down. Easy peasy. The maze of death uh, it certainly has led to a lot of hilarious situations of people trying to climb into the green devil face and people losing the wrong limb, you know, people losing the left hand and, oh, the left hand doesn't work. It's got to be the right hand. A lot of terrible stuff here. Something important to note is the Sphere of Annihilation in the Devil Face, it shouldn't be in the back of the this mouth. It sh you shouldn't have to crawl all the way through this thing. It should be pretty much right at the entrance of it. Meaning that if someone is, for some reason, dumb enough to climb into this thing, as soon as they climb a little bit in there, they will just all of a sudden have their body go limp, and everyone will see that this body just goes limp right there. And if they pull it out, then it's not going to have a, a part of their head. You'll, you'll be able to like look inside and see part of their brain and stuff. Pretty pretty gross. Uh, but you should not be vindictive in that, oh, you have to climb all the way in to find out what it is. Ha ha, because that's just going to be boring. Over here in Area 50, we have a party going on. And this party is happening in a Mirror of Life trapping. Really, really cool stuff, as you can tell here on Roll20 and every other online module. There'll be a whole bunch of uh, tokens here, because this could turn into a clown fiesta, depending on how your players interact with this. Should your players walk down this hallway, or be teleported here from Shigambi's tomb, uh, they might gaze upon the mirror, and when they do so, they must immediately make a DC-15 charisma saving throw, or have themselves shut into the Mirror of Life Trapping. The Mirror of Life Trapping has 12 cells in total, three of which are currently vacant, meaning that if anybody gets sucked into it, nothing happens. Another person gets sucked into it, nothing happens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when a fourth person gets sucked into this mirror, that is when there's going to be a rotation. That is when you're going to have to roll a d12 to see who gets uh, shunted out in their place. So your players, you know, they look at this mirror and, oh, they make the saving throw. And, oh, or maybe, oh, someone. So your players, so your players look at this mirror and some of them make their saves and some don't. Some of them get sucked in. The, the grognard of the group says, hey, let's go ahead and throw a rock at the mirror. Ha ha. This, unfortunately, is... It is a solution, but probably not the solution that you want. If you destroy the mirror, 
then all of the residents inside of the cell are going to get flung out at the same exact time. And that is really, really bad because there is some uh, good things in here and more importantly, there's some bad things. In here. There is a fun little table here which shows uh, what interacts with what. Some of the creatures try attacking each other. Some of them try running away. Some of them just get killed outright, whatever the case may be. Uh, but definitely go off of that if your players don't interrupt anything. But if for some reason, um, more than likely, if your players do get involved, then you should definitely start rolling initiative here and definitely see how their interactions actually, uh, you know, make this uh, blurb different. Something really important to note here is your players could actually know the command words of dealing with this mirror of life trapping if they already dealt with Withers and got his manual of golems. This is incredibly helpful. If they speak the words Kimura and Blackfire in front of this thing and, or, and inside of this thing, they can get freed. I'm willing to bet people don't go around sit yelling out Kimura and Blackfire is a big stretch as well. So it's more than likely they're not going to be spewing these things out unless they have gotten uh, the Manual of the Golem. What's also very nice about this location is there is actually a D12 table showing off all of the inhabitants of this mirror and what they do once they are freed. So starting off, we have a Tan, who is a Cholton commoner who has basically been in here ever since a Sarak killed the, every Omoan. Really scary stuff. We have an Invisible Stalker who is going to kill whoever releases it. We have a Minotaur who is going to attack anyone unless the Cholton champion is here. We have a Troll who is going to attack anyone. We have a Drow Mage who is going to team up with anybody who saves him, but will totally backstab the party or just try and, you know, save his own skin. We have Pox, who is a doppelganger, which interesting about him is that he is making himself look like Biff Longsteel, uh, totally not a porn name. He is a Company of the Yellow Banner member, or at least he is looking like he's a Company of the Yellow Banner member. He joins the party and stays out of, their, out of harm's way. We have a four-armed gargoyle who is going to attack anybody near if it gets released. We have Lukanu, a Cholton champion, incredibly powerful stat block here. Uh, and she will actually help out her liberators. Very, very, very good companion to have. She will actually probably rival people that uh, she is, you know, helping out. What's interesting about her is that she wields an incredibly powerful... Armor. She is wearing scorpion armor, which is plate armor, but way better. It confers the three following benefits. It gives you a plus five to initiative. It makes it so you have you no longer have disadvantage on stealth checks. And you do not have to worry about heat. You don't have disadvantage on uh, you know resisting heat of extreme heat. However, this armor is cursed. If you ever take this off or you ever put it on, you have to make a DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 10 D10 plus 45 poison damage. Insanely strong. She is going to know this and she is not going to be dumb enough to try and take this off. But if your players are feeling rather murder hoboy and see that she's got badass armor on or she gets killed in the process of, get, of escaping and try and put this on, they could be in for an incredibly terrible time. 10 d10 plus 45 on average that's a hundred damage to not you know that, that's that's a lot of damage thankfully it's not one of those uh you you die if you drop to zero but still incredibly incredibly uh powerful last and certainly the least of the mirror's inhabitants is a single sturge which is going to attack the nearest warm-blooded creature but at this level, uh, if you breathe on a Sturge, it dies. I love this area. The Mirror of Life Trapping has a lot of fun roleplay elements. It's got a crazy and hectic combat uh, scenario, especially because of the terrain. The place is super duper packed, so everyone's going to be on top of each other. But more so, I love the roleplay elements. You can definitely have uh, a lot of interesting solutions on how your players want to handle this life trapping mirror if someone gets st stuck in it. They could just try and play Ring Around the Rosie and just have everyone, you know, try and cycle out of this until they all get freed. Uh, I personally have seen, you know, people trying to uh, summon animals and have them as their replacements and one by one trickle in who goes in and who 
you should totally use this mirror of life trapping as a way to throw in more PCs if there's some dead PCs and uh, some fun NPCs that can join the party. Uh, I definitely have thrown in uh, long-term friendly NPCs that are basically thrown into the tomb and are now trapped here. Really, really fun stuff. On to Area 51 here, we have a door, and basically this door requires a blood sacrifice in order to open. Uh, the door will not open unless a pint of blood is offered to the gas that basically control this door. Uh, and there is no mechanic behind giving the blood other than you just simply uh, you prick yourself and you know the blood starts pouring out. Uh, it doesn't say you lose any HP or anything of that nature, but losing a pint of blood isn't that deadly. You know, you, you give a pint of blood every time you donate, so it's realistically not that bad. If your players don't feel the need to uh, give a nice little blood donation to these ghasts, they can try and circumnavigate that by simply forcing this door open. Uh, doing so will mean that the ghast will pop out and attack whoever is uh, refuses to offer up their blood willingly. Uh, fighting three ghast in this tight little corridor could prove difficult because they are, you know, smelly and they do get some good little attacks, but nothing too major. Should your players offer up their blood willingly or unwillingly and eventually open up the door, they will find a really cool area, Area 52, the Throne Room. In this throne room, they're going to look around and they're going to see a throne on the opposite side. But also important is the fact that along the wall is murals. And these murals are dedicated to people that are dying in the tomb. And what's even more grisly is the fact that there is three blind artists that basically paint these, uh, you know, killings and deaths. And uh, you could definitely add a lot of fun flavor to this. If you've had NPCs or PCs die on your adventures here, they will be drawing those. And uh, that'll be really, really, you know, kind of like sketchy. These blind artists have the stat block of zombies, uh, except for the change that they don't fight back. They're essentially worthless. They, they even offer up zero XP if you're playing with XP. Uh, so attacking them uh, is, you know, you know if, if your party likes killing undead things, then so be it. However, <laughs> that will totally activate the trap of this room if they attack these poor, poor blind artists. If the characters turn the undead or destroy any of these uh, blind artists, a Tyrannosaurus zombie is going to spring up from the ground and start attacking. This is scary, scary stuff. An undead T-Rex in the middle of the tomb? My god. Uh, it actually does state here that the T-Rex is way too big to squeeze into any of the five-foot rooms here, either the uh, either the, the spiral staircase or Area 53. But it does state that it can actually squeeze through that main hallway, which I can only imagine the horror that is trying to run away from a T-Rex only for it to be squeezing through and uh, chasing after you with those big old meaty jaws with zombies crawling out of it. Really, really scary and awesome nightmare feel. So what's there to do in this room? Well, uh, they could theoretically find the spiral staircase. They could find the uh, the Area 53, the crypt of the Sun Queen. Uh, but also they can interact with the throne. Should anybody go ahead and touch the throne of Aserak, it, that is going to be some bad news because they must succeed on a DC 16 charisma saving throw or be basically charmed or cursed essentially into the rage of Karagos. And there's a little blurb here that says that Karagos was a uh, minotaur uh, for the city of Omu and his skull is actually resting atop the throne. What does this curse do? It gives whoever touched it 50 temporary HP. Awesome. What's not awesome? Every single turn that whoever's cursed must attack the nearest nearby compatriot. Not fun. Uh, this definitely means that if the hack and slash fighters and barbarians get this, then they are going to be, you know, jacking up their friends. But hopefully if the nerd wizard or sorcerer who, you know, doesn't have anything gets it and only attacks one time with a dinky little dagger, that's not that bad. How do you remove this curse? Well, you can either do it by casting Greater Restoration, Remove Curse, 
or beating the snot out of whoever is cursed, and the curse will go away. Uh, it states that the curse ends if the creature uh, drops to zero HP. So uh, if your friend's trying to stab you, you know, you kind of knock some sense into him and knock the sense out of him. And, uh, and then hopefully everything's all honky-dory. Also sitting on top of this throne is a scepter. And the scepter, as uh, noted by Sarax Warning, has a twin. Uh, this is going to be important for Area 53, the Crypt of the Sun Queen. Area 53, Crypt of the Sun Queen, is uh, actually a bit strange. Uh, it actually states that as a Sarak uh, slew the trickster gods and basically oppressed the people of Omu, uh, the queen, she, uh, Napaka, she basically prostrated herself to a Sarak and said, hey, I offer up myself um, and just, you know, spare my people. A Sarak was impressed by the queen's courage, not enough to spare her life uh, or on her request, but enough to place a special crypt for her. So that kind of keys into, you know, one, who Napaka is. Uh, Napaka, uh, the players might know by interacting with uh, the children of Kirsa Ball. But it also keys into the kind of person a Sarak is. A Sarak, he's going to do whatever he wants, but he does admire, you know, the bravado that some people might have. Should your players find their way into Napaka's crypt, uh, they'll see that uh, there is a sarcophagus, but floating above it is a uh, sun. This golden orb, this uh, floating sun, which is above the, uh, the the coffin, it states that, one, it's got a little smiley face, but two, it doesn't do anything unless people, like, touch it for some reason. Which, admittedly, I have had groups touch it because, you know, they, they try to, you know, make sure if, if it's a trap or not. I, ironically, touching it is the trap, so... Anybody within a 20-foot radius is going to just automatically take 3d6 points of fire damage. Not that bad, but still, damage is damage. Hopefully your players don't go ahead and needlessly touch the orb. Uh, hopefully they open up the sarcophagus and the jewelry box and see all the cool stuff that resides inside. The jewelry box has some pretty sweet swag in it. We've got a cockroach-shaped jewelry box, uh, which it, that itself could go for 1,500 gold pieces. Pretty dope. Uh, but the air cool treasure here is a necklace of fireballs. Uh, players might think to themselves, oh, hey, necklace of fireball, that's awesome. And, you know, go ahead and take it. However, this necklace is totally cursed. When any creature dons this necklace, all of the beads automatically explode. Everybody within 20 feet has to make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or take 16 D6 points of fire damage. Whoever is wearing this, whoever dons this thing, automatically fails. That is just a lot of damage that could potentially hit the whole party and really not fun. This is compounded with the fact that the first time anything is taken from the sarcophagus or the jewelry box, the floating sun radiates out and explodes, dealing 12d6 points of fire damage to anybody that's not in cover from it. Uh, pretty gnarly stuff. The real kicker of this area is the sarcophagus. Should they open it up, they'll be able to see Queen Napaka's body entombed in here. But more importantly, uh, she is holding a scepter. The scepter looks uh, similar to the one in the throne. And this is really important. If they, they need to do an Indiana Jones move, essentially. They need to replace one scepter with the other. If they do not do this, each creature in the area must make a DC 18 constitution saving throw or take 7d12 points of fire of necrotic damage. Really, really bad stuff. Uh, hopefully they pull an Indiana Jones move and uh, don't allow any of that to happen. Why would they possibly think to, you know, take this scepter? Uh, is it worth the effort? Absolutely it is. Uh, a Serax Scepter, worthless, but the Queen Apaka Scepter is incredibly powerful. It doesn't do anything natively, it's not like a magical quarter staff or anything. What it does is, on the next floor down, we'll get to it later, it interacts with one of the traps. There is a trap later on which could essentially grind people to a paste, but if you have this Scepter and touch whatever is trying to kill you, you automatically destroy the stone juggernaut. So definitely an item worth getting, but they probably won't know what it is until they have it. What's also nice to see here is there is a little bit of a blurb about if your players uh, actually try and uh, speak with the dead on Napaka. She basically states, uh, you know, how 
she she grew wise to the trickster gods being what they really are and she doesn't know anything of what's going on because of course she's been dead this and should they talk to them she will uh, basically share her desires in saying that she wants omu restored and most important of all she wants a serag destroyed hopefully your players can uh, live up to that promise Speaking of more Indiana Jones shenanigans, we've got Area 54, The Rolling Doom. Uh, this is the lead-up to Unk's uh, tomb, and if they basically walk down the set of stairs, they'll see at the at the at basically the bottom of the stairs is a treasure chest. Really, really odd, right? Uh, but that's not the important part, as of right this second. The important part is, if they open up this chest, they'll see that there's nothing inside, but a boulder will basically come from behind and slam down the staircase, meaning that everybody who's on there has to try and duck out of the way or get hit. Damage isn't all that bad. Only 4d10 points of bludgeoning damage. No big deal. But you might be questioning, is the chest truly empty? It is not. Interesting enough, inside of the treasure chest is an empty key. Meaning that if players were to basically, you know, manually, you know, feel around this chest, uh, which they would if they were investigating it, then they'll actually just bump into it and hit this invisible key. The big issue here, though, is the fact that the ball, the granite ball that comes uh, spiraling down, it will go ahead and just smash right into the chest uh, outright breaking it. Meaning that the invisible key will be lost in all of the wood wreckage. Uh, however, it does state that a successful DC 15 perception check uh, could uh, make you theoretically find it. Maybe they, you know, they're, they're feeling around and they magically stumble upon it. The last kicker before you get into Unk's tomb is the fact that just beyond the threshold of this hallway here, we have an acid pit. And this acid pit is kind of scary. If they exert more than 100 pounds onto this uh, pit, it'll go ahead and collapse down, and the poor, poor saps that find their way into this horrible vat of acid are going to take 12d10 points of acid damage when they uh, first enter there or start their turn there. This is an extreme killer. If someone's not taken out of the acid vat immediately, they are going to die, meaning that you should definitely have the players be on initiative if this pit trap is sprung. After dodging boulders and pit traps, your players will be able to find themselves in Area 55, Unk's Tomb. Unk's Tomb is actually pretty interesting. When they walk in, uh, beyond, of course, the little acid pit right there, there is no traps. They'll be able to see, though, that there is a coffin, a, a translucent coffin in the center here, and it is constantly shifting colors. It, it is uh, just constantly shifting colors, and... Uh, they'll see that there is a keyhole for it, but uh, they don't have a key as of right this second. Behind the sarcophagus at the back here is where that they can see a maze. This maze is the key haha, to finding the keys that they need in order to open up this uh, sarcophagus. Whoever is the first person to physically touch this uh, maze in the back here is going to all of a sudden find themselves teleported into the maze that they are currently looking at. What this means is that they will be in like some weird little demi-plane, essentially shrunk. But more importantly, the people that are inside of this room are going to be in for a rough time, as immediately 10 Minotaur skeletons are going to bust out of their secret rooms and begin attacking the party. This, this can be a really scary fight, as presumably you've lost already one person whether that be a pc or npc uh and they're lost in this maze and all the meanwhile whoever is left in here is going to have to deal with a whole bunch of undead minotaur skeletons so while the battle rages on in the tomb what about the person or multiple people that interact with the maze well it really just comes down to uh, a simple role if they are in the maze they their really only option here is to either try and scale the maze's walls or trying to just you know navigate themselves around if anybody tries to scale the walls they're going to be in for a rude awakening as whoever tries to get to the top of the walls or uh, fly beyond them is expelled from the maze and they take 5d8 force damage as they're shot out of the maze so uh no cheating on this one you have to basically manually run through this maze there is no map for this because there really doesn't need to be 
Uh, basically, what it comes down to is on their turn, because this is totally going to be on initiative because there's a fight going on. On their turn, if they spend the time basically running around the maze, have them roll a D100. And there's a nice little table here that shows off on a 1 through 70, they find nothing. On a 71 through 75, they find the skull of a kid. On a 76 to 84, they get into a fight with a Minotaur. That can really slow down the process. And depending on who that is, they may not be in the best of shape and might not be able to 1v1 a Minotaur. So really scary stuff. Uh, and then the rest of the roles here, we have uh, people potentially finding the crystal keys. Any character who grabs one of these crystal keys is basically flung back into the real world with no problem, but has the key in their possession. So why all these different colored keys? Well, the keys correspond to when uh, the sarcophagus has its color change. If you get the red key, you can't put it in when the sarcophagus is looking like blue or black or green or whatever. Uh, so basically, if you're trying to do this mid-combat, you're going to be in for a really rough time because the colors change every six seconds. But more so than that, each of these keys actually has a gift attached to them. Uh, a Serac, in a weird you know, twist of fate here, he actually gave a, a basically a really good boon on a lot of these keys. Uh, the black key gives you the Charm of Nine Lives, really strong. The blue key gives you the Charm of the Crystal Heart, not bad, etc., etc. You, you can read all these out and definitely keep note of them uh, for when your players uh, get these keys. But really, really strong stuff. Uh, you know, good on you, Aserak, for uh, making this a little bit more fair. The most grisly one of these keys is the red key, which gives you the charm of the ghoul. Which basically means if you eat someone, you can gain 3d8 plus 3 hit points. Pretty ghost stuff. So your players have bested the minotaur skeletons. They've grabbed one or more of the keys and find themselves back in front of the sarcophagus to open it just in time. And what are they rewarded with? They get a little bit of gold, you know, not that bad. But they get a robe of scintillating colors. Really powerful item. Like, just natively, this item is incredibly powerful. But this item is made so much better by Unk's uh, spirit uh, being attached to it. So, uh, why am I gushing over Unk's spirit? Well, Unk gives you the power of your constitution score becoming 23. And as previously stated, if your constitution rises, your HP rises as if you had that constitution your whole life. That is insane. Unhuman constitution score. This is good for literally anybody. No matter what class you are, just having more HP is insane. It's great for the fighters that get up in the face. It's great for the wizards that sit in the back and don't want to get hit. It's great for the whole, you know, it's great for the whole part. However, for all that HP, what flaw comes attached with it? We have, I am incapable of making decisions. Meaning that uh, you are no longer the shot caller of the party. Meaning that you are going to be racked with indecisiveness and self-absorbed. Very, very uh, potentially damning uh, <laughs> a, a flaw here. Unk Shrine, awesome stuff. We got a lot of cool combat in regards of you know fighting these Minotaur skeletons. We have this RNG element of trying to find yourself in this maze. And that makes the combat even deadlier because presumably you're down at least one party member, if not more. If uh, for some reason multiple people decide to touch the maze at the same time. Uh, so really, really scary stuff. I think one of the scariest aspects of that could be if, uh, you know, if one person goes in the maze, they're all safe and sound, then the Mintar skeletons pop up. Maybe everyone started touching the maze. Now everyone's in the maze, and now everyone's in the maze, and, you know, once one or two people, you know, f find their way out, then they're going to be, you know, faced with ten skeletons by themselves. Uh, really hope your party plans this battle out and doesn't do anything uh, too stupid. After dealing with the Minotaur Skeletons, uh, they will be able to see that there is a hallway that's opened up now. This hallway leads to a Grandfather Clock. What does this Grandfather Clock do? Well, it's got uh, several things going for it. It's got an item uh, located inside, but also it's got a semi-damning uh, magical effect here. At the stroke of every hour, 
uh, anybody within 30 feet of the clock must make a DC 17 constitution saving throw. If they fail, they are magically aged by 10 years. If you're the elf who is, you know, 100 years old, you know, 10 years is nothing. You, you still, you're going to live to like 600, 700. But if you're, if you've got the turtle in the party, who's only going to live to 50 years and he's already 20, like that's a pretty sh huge, you know, shaving of your life off. If you're, if you've got players that are role playing like older humans, uh, that can certainly be pretty disastrous. There is no rules on aging in 5e, but I'm sure if you have players that have uh, player characters that are a little bit older and they get even older to the point where they would be decrepit, there probably should be uh, stat losses in regards to the physical stats. So how do they get to the treasure of this area? Well, unfortunately, they need the invisible key. If the key is inserted, lo and behold, they can find themselves another one of the fabled treasures, the Navel of the Moon. Really, really awesome stuff. It says that it can be sold for 2,500 GP, but can fetch up to three times the price if sold at an auction in a major city. Pretty dope treasure. Hopefully your players uh, decided to find that invisible key or roll pretty good on their uh, Thieves Tools check. And that is going to wrap it up for the everything that you can normally access on level 4 here. However, we still have Area 57, the Oubliette. Uh, Area 57, the Oubliette, can only be accessed one way. If your players have the audacity to try and magically teleport themselves out of the Tomb of Annihilation. As we can tell here just by the picture, pretty gnarly stuff, just tons and tons of dead bodies. Presumably, this is where all the bodies are thrown in when, uh, you know, there's too many for uh, Withers to deal with. So, one or more of your players foolishly thought they could escape the Tomb of the Nine Gods. What do they face? Well, they face a room full of corpses, which smells terrible. There is an Otug in the corner who is hiding. Uh, it will totally jump one person, but it probably would be smart enough not to try and fight a full-blown party. Uh, the only thing that they'll be able to see else in this room is a green devil's uh, face. And the only way they can interact with it is by pulling levers in its nostrils. This is where you pretty much have the 50-50 of uh, living or dying here. Pulling the left nostril lever causes the green devil face its mouth to open. And all of a sudden, everything starts getting sucked in. Every single round for a full minute, they must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw or be basically whisked into the mouth where they are obliterated and destroyed and are totally dead and nothing can ever happen with them ever because they are annihilated. Really, really scary stuff. DC 11 doesn't sound all that bad, but when you realize that you're going to have to roll that 10 times, uh, you know, on average, when you roll 10 times, you're going to get something, you're going to get a bad result at some point. So, really scary stuff. So, all these bodies and this Otug and whoever the frick else is in this room is totally getting pulled into the mouth. And every single round, they're going to have to be making all these, uh, you know, saving throws. Really, really scary stuff. Uh, like, you know, DC 11 dexterity, it looks really, you know, simple. But after 10 rolls, it's only inevitable that you roll a 1 or a 2. However, should your players guess correctly and pull the right nostril lever... Them and whoever is living, which includes the Otug, uh, whoever is in this room, uh, it gets teleported all the way back to Area 5B, which is, in fact, the very beginning of the Tomb of Annihilation. Not outside of it, inside of it. So the Oubliette's no joke. Uh, you know, it's it's practically a 50-50 whether people live or die here. Uh, so if you if you have NPCs that, uh, that get teleport here, then simply just roll whatever, and on a 50-50, they live or die. Or you can have them attacked by the O2, and the O2 takes them. <laughs> All right, that's going to wrap it up for level 4 here, the end of the Grand Staircase. But lots of fun stuff here. Uh, two amazing tombs, uh, you know, lots of crazy traps, lots of saver dies, lots of instant deaths here. Uh, and lots of roleplay possibilities because you can roleplay with uh, a lot of the creatures that you find in the Mirror of Life Trapping. Uh, and of course we have the Oubliette where, of, you know, people that try and run away. 
could potentially uh, meet in a more grisly fate. Lots of fun stuff here, and there's really not too much more I can add other than, you know, just always be sure that your players are having fun at this point, and hopefully they're not having, uh, you know, dungeon fatigue. But the important thing to remember, of course, is the fact that they may not be doing this uh, linearly. They might not be, you know, revealing every single floor one by one. They might be just, you know, running up and down the staircase. Every group I've ran has done the exact same thing. Uh, so definitely take that into consideration. Lots of great stuff here, and I can't wait to hit up level five. We are so close to the end. Level five of six coming up. So go ahead and uh, tell me what awesome stories you have or plan to do here on level five. I have some stories, of course. You know, I've had a lot of uh, PCs trying to go through the cells and inevitably get uh, murdered or just decide to not even bother with it because of how scary it is. I've had a lot of fun with the Mirror of Life Trapping. Uh, I've thrown in some NPCs here that the players uh, ha were friends with outside of the tomb, and they were thrown in here uh, as a, basically a joke and uh, for them to reconvene uh, with long lost friends. I've definitely had some scary encounters with those Bodax in the Maze of Death. Uh, lots of fun stuff. I personally haven't any had anybody uh, try and, you know, escape with a stump for a limb. But I've definitely heard a lot of people doing so. Uh, <laughs> I've definitely heard a lot of stories of people diving head first in that uh, sphere of annihilation as well. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this one. Uh, level 5 coming up soon. Uh, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.